Hey, Ava. Hey, Monique. How you doing? Good. How was school today? Boring. <laughs> What's your podcast about? I need like a background. This week's episode is actually about courage. So have you ever had a moment in your life where you felt like you really were courageous? Yeah. I think I had courage when I had my piano recital. The one you did yesterday for for us, for your family? <laughs> yeah. I think it was hilarious that you just set up your own piano recital and all of us showed up. <laughs> I know. I just really wanted to talk to you guys, but I knew it would be hard to get you guys all on the same Zoom. So I said, oh, spontaneous piano recital. Well, I think that really was courageous. Um, well, I got to go. <laughs> okay. Bye. Love you. Bye. Love you. Hey, everyone. Thanks so much for tuning in to More with Monique. My name's Monique DeBose. I'm a singer, writer, and spiritual coach. My passion in life is to inspire women to choose more. Today's episode is all about choosing more courage. Courage comes in many different flavors and isn't always readily apparent, as you'll soon find out. Our first story is about the courage to leap into the unknown, and the second is about the courage of conviction. But really, they're both about the courage to be who you really are and not care what anybody else thinks. All right, let's get into it. My first guest today is Luisa Molano, an amazing life coach and a successful businesswoman who's had a very interesting and colorful journey to get to where she is today. While working in HR at a Fortune 100 company, she moonlighted as a stripper and, well, I'll let her tell you the rest of the story. My name is Luisa Fernanda Molano, and I choose more courage. It started in California, and I had declared bankruptcy five years earlier. And because I took action to change my results, but didn't address my beliefs, I found myself very quickly in a very similar financial predicament. And I felt so much shame and so much embarrassment that I didn't know what I was doing because I didn't know what I didn't know. And every month there was more debt and more debt and more debt. And I put it on credit cards. And as I look back at it now, it's like, wow, it's so simple. But at the moment, that's what felt true to me. I spent, I put things on my credit card. I bought things I honestly didn't need. And the debt kept going up. And I said, what am I, what can I do? I have a job, a nine to five, and I don't want to get a second job. What can I do that's creative? And I had been dating a guy at the time who said, well, you know, what about dancing? And I was like, what? She's like, yeah, you go. And told me a little bit about it. And I was like, oh, well, that doesn't sound that much of a big deal. How much can people make? And he said, I think you could really make a lot of money and you could very quickly get yourself out of debt as you work to. And he was like the first person that went to address why this keeps happening, right? Like you got to address that too. Mm -hmm. And I went, I auditioned and I got the job. What was in your head when you when he called your name or when you began to do your first dance? My heart started racing and I had like, I'm going to fall on my face because I don't know if you know, but like you got to look the part and those shoes are a whole other ball game. So I walked down, I'm like, please don't fall, please don't fall, please don't fall. And there was this spiral staircase to come down onto the main stage if that's where you were dancing. And I get through my first dance and I was like, Okay, and I pick up my dollars and I was like in my head, I'm like, that was probably people in the audience were like, that is literally the worst dance I've ever seen. And I had this whole story of like, these are pity dollars. I'm like, this is, is this really what my life is now? And within about three months was making money, good money. And I was putting all of it away to save. Because I was like, every day that I walk in and I'm on this stage dancing, there's a part of me that's, this is not a forever. This is a means to an end. Yeah. And I had my little, a little spreadsheet in a notepad. And then I had, what did I make? And then my total. I mean, I could have done it in my phone, but there was, I don't know, something that felt OG about just my notepad. And I had bought a lockbox because I started saving it. I wanted to put it away and get a substantial amount and then just start paying off my debt. So you didn't put it in the bank. You put it in a lockbox like in your house. I have no good answer for why I did that. But yeah, I wanted it at home. I had some story that the government would be like, you're a dancer and we want your money. There was this fear about having the money. Yeah. That if we were to unpack my beliefs around it, we'd probably find a really nice 
connect the dots. So now that I had it, I had to hide it. So it felt like a secret life. Total secret life, which is so ironic when you fast forward just a few months and I'm dancing in Colorado at the largest, most popular dance club while working at a Fortune 132 company in the Department of HR, no less. Also in Colorado. Also in Colorado. Every day at that club that I walked on stage, I said, this could be the last day of my nine to five. Because you thought an employer, a, a colleague and a, 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 would walk in and be like, hey, that's Louisa from HR. There's a really good chance that if someone sees you, mum's the word. Now, if you bump into them and they're like, hey, I saw you last night. Yeah. Or give you the look. That's a whole other story. But no one's going to run to HR and rat you out. And so there was this little, oh, okay. Okay, I'm doing my thing. The, the, the fear was still there. It never went away, but it lessened significantly. Yeah. Yeah. It sounds like while you're in California, you didn't make enough of what you needed. So you continued it when you moved to Colorado. Yeah. The 15 second version of it is the guy that was, hey, what about if you go into dancing? I'm like, well, that's quite an innovative approach to getting out of debt. He lost his job when the proverbial fecal matter started hitting the fan in 2008 and said, I'm from Denver. And if I can't get a job, I've got to go back to Denver. And I was like, okay, well, I'd either break up with him. I'd move to Denver. or We'd have a long distance relationship. I don't think I want to break up. I don't want to do a long distance relationship. I've never been to Denver. But three months after I started dancing in California, this guy walks in and had seen him before, very quiet, kept to himself, only came in alone. And I was like, tuned into him. And I was like, I don't even know why he caught my eye. So one day I danced and he was at the stage and he said, I'd, I'd love to get a dance. I said, sure. So I go, I'm giving him a dance. He asked me my name. He asked me where I was from. And the guy who was at the time, my boyfriend said, if you ever have a guy come into the club and ask you for a dance and ask you if you have a boyfriend, your answer is no. There's a reason why we're not together no more. <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> But he's like, you tell them no, because they'll give you more money, blah, blah, blah. Like he knew the game, all this stuff. So I said, no. And he came back a couple more times and long story short said, I'd love to see you outside of the club. And I didn't need to have been a dancer to know exactly what that meant. And so I said, okay. When you, when you tap back into it, like no shame, just like genuine truth. Why did you say, okay? I said, what would that look like? And he said, a couple times a month, I travel here from Texas and I'd love to see you. And in exchange for seeing you, this is how much I'll give you. I said, well, how long would we be together? He said about two hours. And I did the math. And in two hours, I would make what I made in about eight hours of work at the club. So that's why fast forward to the moment of decision. I'm like, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I really wanted out of debt. I wanted out of there as quickly as I could because I've always had a strong sense of my values mm -hmm. and I've refined and grown and evolved in my values. But I said, if it's not breaking the law and if he has something he wants and I have something I want, the club needs dancers, the club comes in and pays and they pay. Like there was a mutual exchange of energy. Yeah. It was like, we could tell a story about it. And I certainly carried that story about how shameful and how horrible it is to do this and who would do this, but peel away the emotion. Mm -hmm. It was the amount of debt that I was in and I was willing to show up and every day risk my job, mm -hmm. at least when I was in Colorado, mm -hmm. to get out of debt. So the opportunity to do it quicker by seeing someone one-on-one -on -one yeah. was, a, yeah, like a no-brainer. a no -brainer. Wow. I just want to sit with that piece for a minute because that's very powerful. Did you feel alone in the world? So the short answer is yes, mm -hmm. because I wasn't in either world, right? I wasn't a nine to five. I didn't go to Earl's after dinner. Let's go to the happy hour and let's all go and get our drinks, right? Like that just wasn't me, but it also wasn't me over here. So I felt like this chameleon. And I was also at a particular time in life where I 
acted with a lot of courage, but with very low intentionality. Mm. So you were acting with a lot of courage because you were taking big steps and big possible risks outside your comfort zone. Yeah. If you took 20 women working in corporate right now with $55,000 in debt and go, would you go dance to pay off your debt? I'd be willing to bet a good 18 to 19 would say, absolutely not. I'll just stay in the debt. I'll stay in the debt. Yeah. Yeah. I'll pay it off over the next 20 years, whatever. But for me, that was, that was not an option. I had already declared bankruptcy and I couldn't go back. But then I go home and I'm like, well, what am I really about? Mm. What, what do I really want other than getting out of debt? What is the game that I'm playing for? And I know that now my purpose was shaping me because I learned resilience. I learned grit. I developed courage and the ability to leap into anything. I just appreciate you and I really celebrate your courage. I really do. Wow, I haven't thought of this. The, the, the unfolding of our courage as we go forward is one thing. And the reflection of our courage as we look back is a whole other beautiful set of tapestry. I learned so much because like it started as this really serious hustle and then it was, it was fun. Like I would go from one job to another, like anyone that has two jobs. And I had fun and I talked to people and I asked questions. I learned about investing. I learned about stocks. I learned about business because these guys just want to talk. And they're like, their wives, my guess is they're not being very heard at home if they're coming here and talking about their life and what they love and their passions and fishing. And I'm like listening and asking questions. I got really interested in them. Some of them were buying their grandma a house. Like these are real people with real dreams. It's like, we're all just humans. We all have dreams. We all have hopes. And so that's what I'm seeing as I look back at it is, damn, if I would have followed the traditional path, I never would have gotten to know this other beautiful side of humanity. I am so honored that you chose to share your story publicly with me. That, it means so much. Mm. Hey, it's Monique here. I'm still putting the finishing touches on my new album, You Are the Sovereign One. But here's a preview of my first single, Brown Beauty, which drops this Friday, June 25th. You can pre-save it now on all streaming services. Pre-save this song. It's a love song I wrote to my younger self and all women of color. If you want to check out more of my music, make sure you follow me on Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok at I am Monique DeBose. Take a look at yourself. See the queen that I see. You have everything you've ever needed. No one can touch what you've got. Brown beauty. Brown beauty. Hi, I'm Monique DuBose, and this is more with Monique. My second guest is a dear friend of mine with the same first name, Monique Ruffin. She is somebody who I share some very sacred space with in a sister circle that's been going strong for many years with some other fabulous women. Monique is a woman who is deep into the mysteries of the world. She is a phenomenal astrologer. She really communes with the planet and taps into the wisdom that she is, which is kind of why she blew me out of the water when she told me she voted for 45 the first time around. It's Donald Trump. I know she caught a lot of shit for it, but at the time, she had the courage of her convictions. So today, I want to explore some of her reasoning and rationale. My name is Monique Ruffin, and I choose more courage. Now, for those of you who don't know Monique and who can't see her, she's a gorgeous, salt-and-peppered hair, African-American woman 
from where, Monique? I'm from Watts. I grew up in Watts, California. And so knowing this woman and in the stereotypes, I think I hold in my consciousness, I was so surprised that she consciously chose to vote for Donald Trump. And to be able to say that to people is a very courageous thing. So today I want to explore with her some of her reasoning and rationale. Welcome, Monique. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. So I have to ask you, what brought you to vote for Donald Trump? Because when I think of Donald Trump, I think of a man who's racist, white supremacist, misogynist, corrupt, like liar, dangerous, all of these things. So what had you vote for Donald Trump? I grew up in a very politically active family and I really believed the narrative of we will get our power and our equality through the political system. That is what I was raised to believe. I was raised to participate in that way. Education and politics and Jesus, right? Those were the three things I was taught. And I really bought into that stuff and I practiced all of it. And I studied politics in Washington, D.C. I studied American history. I was devoted to what I felt like was the empowerment of Black people through political equity and education. And so after Obama was elected, pretty immediately within the first year of his election, I realized oh, this is a system that doesn't really work. There was something about the Obama um, presidency that really moved me. It was beautiful to see a Black man and a Black woman and Black children as the leaders of the country. I thought that he was going to change politics. I thought that he would be the change for our country that really shifted the systems, not just our social ways of being, because he did shift our social ways of being. But That's not what I was concerned about. Growing up in Watts and growing up with people who really understood racism and experienced it, I wanted our systems to change. I did not want our social structures to change. I want the police department, the prison system, the education system. I want those things to become equitable. So I expected that to happen in Obama's presidency, and it did not. Yeah, your vision was oh, we've got this Black man in the presidency now. Since he has power, right now he's going to change the things that have been horrific and oppressing in this country. And you found out that he just was a part of the system as well, even though he may have made some changes energetically for yes. those of us, because I was so proud. And that he was a mixed race person too. I was like, all right. But it was just a new color in the same system. Correct. And it made me feel so sad. I was like, wow, he is not different, really, not in the ways that we need political change. He is not that. And and there was a lot of like, well, he's not capable because the Republicans won't let him. I was like, okay, well, maybe it's the system. I don't know if it's the man or the system. It doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. I'm not happy with any of it. (laughs) And so I became really aware and clear that the system needs to change. The system has to die. That's what I just started to realize. Like, oh, we're fixed in something. And the beauty of my life was having grown up in poverty and really experiencing the Black experience in ways that Most of my peers don't have an experience, honestly, right? Like I have been educated and I have had the privilege, lack of a better word, to grow up very impoverished. And because of my intellect, I've gotten into environments that are not impoverished, where there's education, right? So I've been exposed and, you know, most people just want to be comfortable, Mm-hmm. And and they will do anything to protect their comforts. So I realized that our political system protects people's comforts. It protects people with privilege. It protects people with money. And Obama just came in to do more of that. So now we're in 2016. Yes. And you're very cognizant that 
It's the system that needs to die. So let's talk about Trump. So this is exactly how it happened. And there's, I was writing blogs, you know, a lot of my work is about our spirituality, just understanding that we come from the inside out and that our country is what it is because we are internally spiritually corrupt. We don't care about the well-being of humans. We care about money. We care about capital. We care about economy, but we don't care about our children and our elderly and the earth and all of those sort of things. And we're just sort of at a stalemate. So I was going to vote for the Green Party. Like, I I remember being depressed for months and writing about we have Trump because we deserve him and we're not doing anything. And, you know, and I didn't believe initially that he would be elected. I was just like, there's no way. Okay, this is like, we're going to learn our lessons. That's what I thought. We're going to learn from this. Mm -hmm. And, And then he kept getting further and further and further. And I was like, wow, this is really interesting. So I was going to vote. I wasn't going to vote for Hillary because I grew up in Watts. I grew up in the 80s when they, when the political system created the prison system. And I watched all of my peers, many of my peers in Watts go to prison for drug dealing. I watched drugs be flooded in the Black community. All of this stuff was political maneuvering from Reagan, from all of those things are known, that's known stuff now. And that influenced my life, right? So I watched my family come undone because of drug addiction, prison. All of this stuff was in my living room, right? So I'm not going to vote for Hillary Clinton, right? So I was going to vote for the Green Party. I go into the voting booth and I hear my heart say, vote for Trump. And I was flabbergasted inside of myself. It was like, what? And I just did it and almost ran out of the booth and came home and laid down and thought to myself, what am I thinking? What was that? It was such a clear direction to vote for him. And I did it. And and then that I was like high, like I was elevated in the spiritual way that felt like I had drank a lot of coffee, like my heart. It was really weird. And then I went to a political voting party at a girlfriend's house. She and her family, they're white and they were all sad and really overcome with grief. And I was aware that I was not. And I was aware that they were experiencing something that I had experienced all my life. They were experiencing the truth of America in a way that white people had not, that I had never seen. Mm -hmm. So this is after Trump has been declared the winner. Yes, that night at a party. And so I was like, wow, this is really interesting. And so maybe the next few days I started to tell people that I had voted for him. And I started to realize that I wasn't sad. I wasn't depressed. I was actually aware that I was supporting the collapse of the system. And I knew I could feel that he was arrogant enough, entitled enough that he was going to do whatever he wanted the way that only white men can in this country. And that was going to be the beginning of the end of this system. Let's go back to the man. You believe that this uh, white entitled man would help destroy the system because of those qualities. Yes. So this man obviously grabbed pussies. He said that. He paid off people because he didn't want sex scandal. He was a horrific person with his dad around like being racist in their real estate dealings. And so was all of that conscious in the voting booth when you got that like hit? Yes, I was aware of who he was when I got the hit. And his connections to Russia. Absolutely. I was aware of who he was. And how it resonated for me was this is the epitome of white male privilege. This is the, this is, he is the representer. He is, he represents the slave master to me. Mm -hmm. He represents Everything that white maleness is from the beginning and the onset of this country. And I would rather see it up front on the stage 
because this is the truth of who we are. This is it. And I want to face it. I'm going to I'm going to look the monster in the face. I'm no longer running. I am not interested in pretending. Bring it home. So when you say he is the representation of the slave master, my brain goes to why would you want to give the slave master more power? Here's the thing. We've been lying in this country about who we are. We've been pretending that we are something that we're not. We've been complicit. Exactly. And so we cannot fix what we do not look at. We cannot address what we have not revealed. Trump was the revelation of the core poison of this country. It was the revelation of it. Mm. And we needed to see it. Liberal white people needed to see what they are complicit in. Mm. We all needed it. I needed it. And it helped me. It healed me because I got to see this man has no power over me. I'm not subject to this. He has no power in my life. And now from that experience, I really got to see clearly what our politics is like, how it works. And I no longer participate. I did not vote in the last election. I might never vote again. So I got to ask you in terms of like you being courageous in going against popular narrative, cultural narrative, you being courageous to trust a guidance that shows up and turns on a dime what you were planning on doing. And then I want to know about the courage around talking to people. So I know when you told me, I had to take a minute. I was like, I love this woman. This woman is so wise. I don't know if I want to be her friend anymore. (laughs) I had to go through that process. Mm. And I feel like I'm a pretty gentle human and I really try to see all sides. So did you have conflict or was there like a moment when you had to be even courageous again in having conversations with friends? Yes, I was terrified. I was really terrified because I knew I was doing something that, first of all, I knew that I was really voting against myself. But I also was clear that the whole system is against every Black person. So I got really clear what I was standing for. I'm standing for the destruction of the system. And yes, every conversation I had was challenging. And many of my friendships still today have not recovered or won't recover. And I'm at peace with that. But at the time I shook in my boots and it was really challenging. And like I would write things politically on social media and and friends will call me privately and say, you haven't told the whole truth. You have to tell that you voted for Trump. And, And so I had to really give myself permission to be vulnerable, to be naked, to stand for My experience, which is unique in this country, I grew up in Watts in the crack epidemic. I have watched my peers go to prison. I understand this political system in ways that most do not. So I cannot expect people to understand me or my plight or the walk that I have had because they are not a Black woman who grew up in poverty in this country. So I understand that people don't get it. I understand people's fear. I understand that most people who have political power are not suffering or have not suffered enough in the system to want to do anything that would make them uncomfortable. And I get it. So I'm not mad at people. I just know what I had to do for myself to have peace. And so when friends called you and said, hey, Monique, you're sharing all these views on social media about politics, but you're not telling the whole story, which was that you were sharing views without also sharing, hey, I voted for Trump. Yes. How did that happen? One of my close friends who was also your friend, I won't name her right now, but she was like, you haven't shared the whole story. And I said, she's right. And I just shared the whole story, just writing about it and saying it. And it was hard and people came after me on social media. Like I said, my friendships really changed. And then I just got more and more comfortable with it. I didn't do it every day, but I did it enough. I just became really transparent. That takes 
courage or joy. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I love you so much, lady. <laughs> thank you for being here. I appreciate it. And I appreciate you. Well, thank you for having me. Hey, it's Monique. Did I mention that my new album, You Are the Sovereign One, drops on August 27th? Well, here's another little taste. As we're celebrating all things courage today, I feel like this song, New Wine, Old Skin, is perfect. Meet me under the hot moon over my mouth. It's a song about a woman claiming her desire with no apology. Go ahead, girl. I'm yours in the moment. time for you to choose more. One of my idols, Ella Fitzgerald, said, just don't give up trying to do what you really want to do. Where there is love and inspiration, I don't think you can go wrong. Take a minute now to think about some things you absolutely desire in your life. Some things that come from love and inspiration. Grab a sheet of paper or your favorite journal or that envelope sitting right next to you and write them down. Now, Think about one tiny, courageous step you can take to move forward with these things that you desire. When we can be courageous to take tiny action steps, we move closer to what it is we actually desire in the world. You are courageous. If you enjoyed today's episode and want to continue the conversation, join my community of Women Choosing More on Facebook. This is a safe space for women and for every female identifying person to connect and encourage each other as we choose more for ourselves together. Plus, we've got plenty of behind the scenes more with Monique content, guest interviews, live conversations with me, and so much more. Thanks so much for joining me this week. Our producers are Larry Carlat and Hannah Randall. Administration details, Angela York. Today's episode was edited and mixed by Ronnie Mickelson. Our theme song was written by yours truly. Hope you have a great week and remember to... Be the woman that you know you are. Don't you settle for travel farthest.